Welcome to the open call talking about the, the resume of the future. And if you are tweeting or, or on Instagram or any of those things, our, our handle on Twitter is at CareerTL. So it would be lovely to have some information that you all might be interested in and share as we go through. Feel free to tweet that out. And I am Marie Zimanoff, CEO of the Resume Writing Academy and Career Thought Leaders. Very excited today to have Louise Kurzmark and Jan Milnick, and we'll have a few other ACRWs and MRWs that I know will be sharing in the conversation, including Cheryl Minnick, who also hopefully was able to um, join us as a panelist here. And we will be sharing some information, but we also want to make sure that we get your insights and your thoughts and your expertise. So we're going to talk a little bit about social media recruiting and what that looks like and how that's changing a resume. We're going to look at recruiting technologies and what's coming up there and how that's changing what looks like a resume. And then we'll talk a little bit about future resume formats and possibilities. And through all of these topics, please do feel free to share, ask questions. I'll be monitoring the chat and um, also be looking forward to your thoughts and questions as we go through this ses the session. I have obviously have um, data and articles to back up the information that I'll be sharing, but putting all of those links into the slides is going to get a little messy. So what you will get at the end of this session, you'll get the recording and you'll also get the link to an article where I'll include all of my sources. So you can go through those and you can share that information and you can have all of that data at your fingertips to read and to share as well. We're just going to compile it into one place for you on the Resume Writing Academy website. So after the session, probably a couple hours it'll take for the recording to process, and then you'll get the link and the link to where all of the sources will be. Again, you can use the chat or the Q&A to ask your questions and share your insights. Either one works for us. So as we get started here, just some information for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Resume Writing Academy. We have an e-summit coming up that Jan and I will be doing on eluding ageism, how we can write for those clients who are age 50 plus and help them position themselves for the, the jobs they want without hearing those dreaded words of overqualified or too expensive. How can we help them market themselves? So we'll be driving into that. Then we have our resume writing training class and ACRW certification program starting live in September. That is always available as a self-paced option, but we'll have the actual live class starting in September. And then our profile writing training class starting in November. And then I'll be partnering with Cheryl Minnick, who is also on the call as, as we do an, a session on education resumes, education administrators, education staff, all of those folks that work in, and give all, all their talents, either helping our young people learn or college age folks will be doing a, a wide span there of educators and CVs. Career TL is our Instagram or is our um, Twitter handle. Our Instagram is career leaders. So career leaders on Instagram. Love if you follow us there. We kind of just got started with Instagram. And part of why we got started with Instagram was a, an event related to this event. For those of you who are futurists and love thinking about what's happening in the future, every year we host our career jam. And this is an opportunity for you to get together with your colleagues and talk about what is coming up in the future. For the 2017 event, we put together this infographic of the different trends that our colleagues see coming up in the future. And we'll be doing that event again, November 30th of 2018, and be looking at the trends that you all see coming up for the next year. So you'll find that on the Career Thought Leaders website, our Career Jam event and registration for that will open here in the next couple of weeks. So if you love to think about the future, and, and I know this is one of Louise and Jan's favorite events, 
to get together with your colleagues and really think about what's coming up and how do we be prepared to help our clients in the future. So a few of you that aren't as familiar with the Resume Writing Academy reached out and says, what is an e-summit? An e-summit is our fancy word for a webinar. So it's a two-hour webinar, and we love and love and love to give you information, give you resources that you can refer back to later. So you'll always get a robust set of handouts with samples and tips and tricks and questions to ask your clients. We uh, put together a good packet for you for every one of those e-summits. And as I said, Jan and I will be doing one here shortly on helping clients ages 50 plus. And we do these all the time. We have about 18 of them in our library that you can go and look at, always including lots of resources for you on specific topics in resume writing. Our Academy Certified Resume Writer Program is an in-depth training program. You get to write, you get feedback on your writing, you get strategic assignments that really make you think and make you work. Um, it's, it's a great program if you're really wanting to transform how you write and what your resumes look like and sound like and the results that they get. Similarly, we launched a profile writer class a few years ago where we go through very in-depth on writing social media profiles. And what does that look like? How do you format them? How can you make them stand out? And then what are the current trends in terms of voice and writing those profiles? We don't just look at LinkedIn. We also look at Facebook and Twitter. And you'll see why we do that as we start to go through some of the data here in just a minute on social media recruiting. So we started this conversation today because there's so many articles coming out all the time about the resume being dead. A few, maybe a few months ago, a year ago, there was one on, is the cover letter dead? And it's easy to get caught up in the hype. It's confusing for our clients to read some of these things. So we wanted to go through where is the current state of the resume? What does that look like? And then what might it look like in the future? And we're gonna go through some of the limitations of the technologies right now that are making a resume still required in, in most cases, so that you can watch for those trends as things start to shift, as LinkedIn especially changes things. You can see, are they moving in a direction that is going to make the resume even more obsolete? or perhaps they're moving in a direction that, that keeps the resume alive. We're gonna talk about some of the limitations of all of the recruiting technologies and what you can look for to keep an eye on this resume and is the resume dying or, or is it still in a necessary piece of the information that our job seekers need. So an article just came out and we shared this in our e-newsletter last week from CNN, and it talked to the one of the hiring managers at Cisco, a technology company, and the person said that the resume had gone from 30 to 40 percent of the hiring process to 10 percent of the hiring process, but it didn't give any other information. If that 10 percent of the hiring process is, you know, HR puts it in their file, then it may not be that big of a deal. If the 10 percent that it's part of in the hiring process is all of the all of the process people, all of the hiring team looks at it when they're getting ready to interview someone, then it is still necessary. So data like that confuses us. It confuses our job seekers because it makes it sound like it's not really needed, but we have no information of what part this 10% of the hiring process is. And it could be a crucial part, even though it's only 10%, right? And then this was from a job bite research study in 2017, showing that only 26% of recruiters consider cover letters important. Only 26%. Of course, the challenge there is how do you know if your client is applying to one of those 26% or not? Um, so you could say, yes, the cover letter is dying. It's only important to 26%, but to those 26%, it isn't, it isn't dying at all. In fact, it may be very, very important. And then when I read a lot of articles about the resume dying, they refer to artificial intelligence, AI, 
and the algorithms that artificial intelligence is using and robots and how these things are taking over the recruiting process. When you actually read the articles, artificial intelligence and algorithms right now are applied to resumes. That's what they're using to read the artificial intelligence and the algorithms are scoring resumes, not LinkedIn profiles, although we'll talk about that coming here maybe shortly in the future. Right now, all of the articles are about how these technologies are interacting with a good old fashioned resume that, that, that we're writing for our clients. And I loved this quote from a, a writer in the Recruiting Trends blog, reports of the death of recruiting have been greatly exaggerated. And I would say the exact same is true with resumes, at least right now, of, of, as of this date, that reports of the death of the resume are also greatly exaggerated. That doesn't mean we don't want to be watching the trends and seeing what's coming up next. Part of those trends, um, Jobvite does a great job each year putting together this data. We try to share it as, as much as possible. Their graphics have become a little bit less um, informative in recent years. So you'll see that this study is from 2016 because they didn't look at this exact data in 2018 or 2017. I mean, but they are looking at what are people using to hire. Now this data is also a little bit confusing because these people are evaluating candidates. They're not necessarily using these to have people apply, but this is where they're going when they're either sourcing candidates, so finding candidates, or evaluating them after they apply. They're going to look at these social media. So obviously LinkedIn, way ahead, but Facebook and Twitter, maybe not as low as you would have imagined. And that Facebook number was even a bit higher this past year, moving up to 55%. So when we think about where our clients are and what recruiters might be looking at, this is where they're looking. Again, it's not necessarily how they're accepting applications. There's some career, re career builder research that came out last year as well, just kind of giving some more detail around this. You know, HR do are paying attention to social media, especially in the screening phase. Now, LinkedIn likes to promote itself, so you'll find an article on their LinkedIn blog that there's a hire made every 10 seconds using LinkedIn. But again, no specifics around is that actually using the apply on LinkedIn button or is that just through networking and recruiters networking on LinkedIn? So a lot of different ways that that's happening. And then most articles that you'll find about LinkedIn and the apply on LinkedIn button, and I tried to do a little bit of research connecting to some recruiters, got some response, and not too surprisingly, most of the time our, our applicants are being asked to attach a resume or upload their resume into the applicant tracking system, even if the company is accepting that application on LinkedIn. So we're not quite there yet in terms of LinkedIn replacing the resume for the majority of companies. And that doesn't mean it's not coming. So what are the limitations and what, what will LinkedIn need to change to make that more possible? We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Jan, Louise, anything you wanna jump in with at this point? Marie, I'd love to weigh in on the fact that I do not believe the resume or cover letter for that matter are anywhere near dead. In fact, we um, had an opportunity to talk with Jerry Crispin a few years back of Career Crossroads who made the statement backed up with statistics that 100% of referred candidates who are qualified are either pre-screened, contacted, or interviewed. And the way by which most clients can effectively network to get that reference is by providing a resume, concise summary value proposition, and a cover letter that tells their story to the person they're asking to refer them. It makes them easy to refer when they provide those two documents. So I'm going to put my stake in the ground that we are delivering incredible value to our clients by providing those services. Well, and the referral and the networking is so important and 
still today, what I'm hearing from most HR folks is they still need a resume and it still needs to be good enough to hire you just because someone refers you. If your resume doesn't show you're qualified, HR likes to dot their I's and cross their T's and, and that resume still needs to show that they're qualified. Of course, we know that, that networking is much more fruitful and, and much more important than applying online. And we're going to talk a lot about online technologies today. So definitely want to acknowledge what you're saying, Jan, in that networking piece. If you're having trouble with the audio, it's most likely that you have a lot of windows open on your computer and that's eating up your bandwidth. So if you're having trouble with the audio or the visual, um, consider closing down some of the windows on your computer and see if that improves your bandwidth and ability to see us and, and hear us better. And Cheryl, I'm going to try unmuting you here just a second and see if you can say hello. Nope, we're not hearing you. So you might try calling back in, Cheryl, and we can see if that would work that way. And we also lost Louise. How did we lose Louise? We usually have a different system running because we usually have so many folks on the line, but it's wonderful to have so many folks on the line. All right, so these are the types of trends that, that we're going to be digging into a little bit more here. Um, so we're going to be talking about hiring technologies, and what does that look like? and what's changing in applicant tracking systems. And of course, applicant tracking systems are one of the biggest obstacles to social media hiring because downloading your LinkedIn profile into an applicant tracking system is not where most people are. Uh, saw a statistic and I'll, I'll get the resource for this in that link that I'll send to you, that most companies are operating on an HR system that's eight years old. So when you think about a system that's eight years old, it's not going to be smart enough to integrate with LinkedIn and for a company to download a LinkedIn profile into their applicant tracking system just aren't there yet. And the amount of investment that people are making into these types of technologies is not as great as you think it might be. And it's picked up in the in the few, last few years because of the talent war, if you will. But that doesn't mean that companies are, are caught up yet. So um, that applicant tracking system is still definitely an obstacle to hiring. And as we watch the trends and we start to see those systems be able to accept like a LinkedIn profile, that will be an indicator that, that perhaps things are shifting. HR policy. You know, most of the HR folks I know, again, really like to dot their I's, cross their T's. They want a resume because a resume is that person's saying that this is what's true and it doesn't change, right? Someone can go and change their LinkedIn profile fairly mm -hmm. easily and you may not have that record of this is what they applied with, this is what they said was true at the time. Of course, some HR companies, companies, some HR organizations are figuring out how to do that differently, but for the most part, a resume is still the official mm -hmm. document that our client is submitting and, and perhaps even a resume mm -hmm. and a and a application for those people. So Marie, we'll have that. Um, Hello, Marie. This is Jan. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm getting notification that people are trying to call back in after the call drops and hitting the 100 people limitation for the call. So there seems to be a little technology snafu. Oh, well, I was supposed to have more availability than that for this call. So I'll, I'll have to write to Zoom and see if they can increase that. Okay, it does show we have 122 logged in, uh, but Louise was one of the people kicked off. So, oh no, moment, she's not yes. in the call. All right, well, I will um, 
I'll send them a message right now and see if they can fix that. Okay. Jan, I don't know if you've experienced this same thing with the HR folks and, and them wanting to have an official resume on file. Absolutely. I have yet to have any client get through the process without needing their formal resume uploaded into a company's site or presented in person as well. Um, it just is not going away and HR definitely seems to be making that across virtually every industry with which I work. I don't specialize by discipline or industry. And so crossing healthcare, engineering, academia, manufacturing across the board, that resume ultimately has to get into their system. Yeah, and then that, that's a, you know, that's a sticking point for a lot of folks. So the next area, of course, is that we tell our job seekers to target their resume, but on social media, you only get one profile. You only get some of, of those, um, you know, you don't have the opportunity to target it. And that's challenging for our clients. And also if they're currently employed, they're not going to feel like they can um, that, they're, that they can adjust it because they don't want to alert to their current employer that they're job seeking. So that's uh, one of the other limitations that we're seeing right now with social media, especially because so many folks are employed and looking, right? When, people, when there was a greater number of unemployed, this may have not been as much of a, a deal killer. But right now when we have the number of people that are currently employed, their use of social media for job search is different. It, it can still happen. And of course, we're coaching our clients in how to do that. But they're not as openly available because of this. And I, we have Louise back, so she could comment on any of these areas as well. And, and Jan, look forward to your thoughts there. Do you have clients who are currently looking? Are they um, tentative about updating their profile? I'm not facing much resistance at all from my clients as compared with 5, 10, 12 years ago, where kiss of death, if you were on LinkedIn, it meant you were unemployed and searching. Now, most of my C-suite folks, mid and rising tier executives and college grads recognize the value of having their well amplified profile and value proposition on LinkedIn. So they're not shy about it anymore. Good. So there's some culture piece that's helping with this. Very much so. Louise, are you seeing the same thing? I am, and I'm sorry for, for being absent for a few minutes, a little technical glitch. Anyway, yes, I am exactly noticing what Jan is, that it's just no big deal anymore to have a social media profile, typically LinkedIn being the most common. Um, but what I'm finding from our perspective is the challenge is writing that summary section or the profile itself in a way that indicates the person is still actively engaged in getting results for that employer as opposed to fishing for new opportunities because it, you want to look professional and you want to look like while you're in that job, you're doing that job. So I, I think that becomes for us a writing uh, you know, challenge and how we, how we position the person to be still an employed person and also uh, attracting opportunities through keyword matches and through, you know, focus areas and employers. So some of that is kind of fun to figure out how to write that. Yes, yes. And so a different way of writing that, obviously, than what we're going to put on the resume, which gives us more ways to help our client. Exactly. And clearly, we end up having to strip away a lot of the proprietary information on LinkedIn, um, especially for privately held companies. But I do reinforce with every client, if they are passive candidates, they will be most attractive. And therefore, we really want to talk to their accomplishments, their brand of leadership. And we never dip into that water that we would for an unemployed client by indicating would love to explore opportunities or something like that. We simply don't go there ever on an employed client's LinkedIn profile. 
yeah, other ways that we can do a call to action or get their contact information in there rather than making them look like a job seeker. Um, you know, the leadership piece and they're open to connections of folks that may want to join their team. I do all kinds of other creative calls to action to get their contact information in there and make them sound open without making them sound like a job seeker. Exactly. One of my favorite lines is, I'd love to connect with like-minded professionals. And that yeah. seems to be the trick. Yeah, very simple. And then one of the other challenges, and LinkedIn is doing a lot to try to fix this right now, all of the all of the changes that you see are them trying to get people to LinkedIn on a more consistent basis because it's just not a place where people go unless they're actively selling something um, like all of us maybe who are trying to get clients or actively job seeking. They're just, you know, people aren't going there unless it's for a specific reason and, and LinkedIn's average monthly user are much lower than Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, of course, it's still a great place for recruiters to go and for us to go to get clients, but it's not what it could be. And, and recruiters know this, right? They know that candidates aren't there as frequently as they'd like them to be. And so that's part of why they're using other social media as well to both screen people as well as try to connect with people. Marie, I think that's a really interesting statistic because we all think everyone's on LinkedIn because, of course, all of our clients are or should be. But in reality, they're not. And what you're seeing on LinkedIn is exactly what you said, job seekers and those who are trying to pitch services to job seekers like ourselves and like other consultants and, and advisors who are interested in sharing their point of view, creating their own online visibility, and yes, making themselves um, visible to people who might be wanting to engage their services. So it's kind of an interesting mix. But it does also point out to me, one of the interesting things is that with LinkedIn being the, the, the giant gorilla, it is still representing just a very small percentage of people. So what else will arise to kind of take over LinkedIn or go along with LinkedIn or otherwise give people an opportunity to create that online profile and visibility for themselves without having to use that LinkedIn platform. Yeah, and boy, that'll be interesting. I know that um, you know, for, for a few years, we've been talking about will industry-specific platforms come up and, and take a bigger role. And in some industries, that's happened a little bit. You've got GitHub in the developer community. Um, you have some other social networks, but you also have some where people tried and it didn't work. Um, oil Pro, for instance, I'm in Colorado, so big oil and gas industry, and Oil Pro maybe four years ago was kicking off and had people inviting me to oil pro and, and I think it's actually all, all together disappeared. So in some industries, those specific networks seem to work. And in some industries, they, they, they don't seem to work as well. One of the things interesting about this particular graph is that Facebook, I think if the number, if I'm seeing it correctly, is about 85% active job seekers, that is not reflective at all of my clientele. Certainly executive and C-suite folks are not using Facebook. Um, maybe you both have different uh, findings, but getting folks uh, to navigate over there works well for the kids that dropped using it when their parents got active on Facebook, I can usually persuade them to use it for connections and introductions. But anywhere from the mid-tier up, they are definitely resisting Facebook. So I'd be curious who this 85% reflects. Any thoughts? Well, so this isn't saying that they're using it for job search. It's saying that if they're active in job search, they're also active on Facebook. Oh. So it doesn't mean that they're using it for job search. I think the fallacy to our clients is that they don't realize recruiters are looking for them there, even if they don't think they're using it for job search. Mm. You know, you've got that 55% of recruiters that is, that is using it. Um, because they're trying to connect with those people who are there, even if they're not there for job search. And that's, so that's the disconnect there is that the 83% of job seekers are there, even if they're not thinking they're using it for job search. 
I think that's really important because you will have people saying things on Facebook and, you know, um, being visible in a way that is possibly not beneficial for their job search. And they need to be careful of that because even though they think if it's a private friends forum, it really isn't. (laughs) Um, And, you know, recruiters and employers will find information about you. So obviously it needs to be uh, on brand and appropriate, even in what you consider to be a friend forum. And I'll share the link to this data. This data is from 2016. And then we have some data on 20, from 2017 that's active monthly users. It's not exactly specific to job search, but it shows this same trend um, in terms of the active monthly user from LinkedIn is really low. In fact, in a long list of social media it's third from the bottom. So it's LinkedIn's active monthly user is quite abysmal when you compare it to almost every other social media out there. Um, I don't think that Facebook is going to take over for job search necessarily. It's just thinking about how all of these pieces play together for our clients and how they could use it. You know, I think how could they use Facebook for job search in ways that they're not thinking about and being aware of how companies are using it that they might tap into. Um, you know, a few years ago at a recruiting conference, I heard a guy from a municipality talking about how they have a weekly chat on Facebook and just on their municipality Facebook page, they do a chat on Wednesdays at noon for anyone who's interested in talking to HR at that the municipality about their job search or their application. And so types of companies you wouldn't expect are using Facebook in ways you might not think of that would be accessible and, and great ways for your client to connect with companies if they might get over the fear of Facebook. And as Louis said, realize that companies are already looking at it. Even if you think you've really hidden it, um, you know, nothing is quite as private as we think it is when we're online. So use it to our benefit instead of being trying to hide it. So the other type of technology, of course, the elephant in the room is these applicant tracking systems. And um, this is fairly recent data, 95 plus percent. Some said 95, some said 98 percent. The job scan article that said 98 percent of Fortune 500s are using applicant tracking systems. Saw some other data that 75 percent of large companies, but they didn't really define what large company meant. Um, 75% of large companies use applicant tracking systems. And that's where the resume is still king, right? The resume still has to go into that applicant tracking system. All of your um, artificial intelligence, your algorithms, all of those operate within an applicant tracking system that's scoring a resume. And that's where we're seeing, of course, the online job applications need a resume. Are we trying to get our clients out of applying that way? Of course. And when they go to apply online, we're being aware of what an applicant tracking system is and does and what type of resume it needs. Now, the biggest issue here is that there are still lots and lots of myths about what a resume needs to look like to go through an applicant tracking system. And and in fact, we might be hurting our client by holding on to some of those old beliefs about what it needs to look like to get through an applicant tracking system because we can actually capitalize on some of the other trends and and data driven effective trends if we know what an applicant tracking system can do so cheryl i'm sorry we're not able to hear you but i love this new graphic cheryl and i talk about applicant tracking systems all the time we have an e-summit specifically on applicant tracking system resumes and this is some new data around what systems the fortune 500 are using but you can see that there's 21 percent that are using other and that's where it gets tricky because there's 190 ATS options on the market. So we don't know necessarily what people are using and um, and what all those systems can do, but we do know what most systems can do and we know what systems are, are going towards doing. And so we can design resumes towards that, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Anything you would add, Louise or, or Jan, about the applicant tracking systems? 
Well, I would say, this is Louise, I would say that the, the best thing about this horrible system of applicant tracking system is that they are getting smarter. So they've made it, it, we don't have to any longer create multiple versions and text versions because what we're doing in a well-structured, well-written, well-organized resume that we would write for our clients in most cases is going to be read without difficulty. So that's certainly been a plus. Uh, I just was involved in a, briefly involved in a very long discussion on um, uh, Ask the Headhunter about the death of HR and how the way that they are recruiting, quote, recruiting people through the applicant tracking systems is honestly just not working. So no matter how sophisticated they get the technology, they haven't figured out a better way to identify, they haven't yet figured out a better way to identify and ma manage the number of the candidates that they're getting. So that whole system is problematical. Obviously it exists and it's worth a lot of money to that industry and they believe they're using it for uh, lots of good reasons. So I think it will continue to evolve and it's our job to stay on top of it so we know what's going on and we can advise our clients appropriately. Yes. Well, and, you know, there's so many, I mentioned JobScan wrote one of these articles about 95% of the Fortune 500, and they are, of course, trying to help job seekers grade their resume, um, you know, match it to the position description. I always argue that if you are writing a good strategic resume and you're helping your client speak to the skills that they need in a active way, accomplishment statements that include the keywords, you really don't need to pay someone to optimize that resume, right? You're, you're doing it from the very beginning by having the focus and the strategy in your document. And, you know, you can run it through JobScan and see how it scores. But if you're writing a good solid resume, it's going to score well, as long as you're paying attention to that client's focus in the job description that you're targeting. Um, I think part of the challenge with some of those services is, of course, they're trying to make money, too. So they're marketing to our clients. They're saying, you know, hey, your resume only scores this percent. You need help. You need to work on it. And we just have to dig into that with our client a little bit and understand, are they applying for the positions that we talked about when we wrote the resume, which is usually where it's falling apart when I talk to someone who's struggling. They're not, they're not applying to the types of positions that we talked about when we wrote the resume. And, and if they are then look at some job descriptions and make sure that we're aligned with the keywords. But it really isn't rocket science. Uh, it's, it's just focus and strategy. Exactly. Well said. <laughs> and um, formatting wise, so two resources. One, we do have an, a two-hour e-summit where Cheryl goes very in-depth in terms of the formatting that does and doesn't work. Two, we have a guidelines document in our store that goes through what does and doesn't work. And three, we have a free 45 minute long designing resumes call that's on the Resume Writing Academy website. It's also on YouTube, our Career Thought Leaders YouTube channel, 45 minutes long. And we go through some formatting things and, and talk about what does and doesn't work in in applicant tracking systems. And lastly, I would say I have an article on my LinkedIn pulse. So in my LinkedIn section, there's some of the biggest ATS myths in an article. The largest myths I would say are around formatting stuff. So all of the stuff around formatting in terms of bold, italics, underline, shading, any of the comments you hear that those things don't work in applicant tracking systems is from the way back when applicant tracking systems used to read a resume like a scanner, resumes aren't read that way anymore. They're read like HTML code. And so none of that formatting matters. The only formatting that still gets in your way is a text box because it's a separate inserted picture kind of thing that can't be read. Doesn't mean that your document won't be scored. It's just that text box won't be scored. Graphics won't be scored, but again, they won't mess up the scoring in most systems. And the last thing that won't be scored sometimes is tables, but most systems are fine with tables. They just read them in a very specific way. So you need to understand how to design the table so that the ATS will read it the way you want it to. But none of those formatting elements prevent your resume from being read in most systems. They just don't get read themselves. They don't get scored themselves, text boxes and graphics specifically, and sometimes tables. 
So most of the stuff that's out there around formatting and ATS is old. It's from the old type of system that really isn't around as much anymore. Most of the systems have moved over to reading your document like an HTML document, the back end of, of a website, if you will. Um, so we've got those resources that you can go look at, and I'll send out the links to those when I send out the recording as well. So what other kind of technologies are we dealing with here? And some of these are a little bit more unknown to us. Um, so the idea of, of artificial intelligence sounds scary. But when you read some of the articles around this, it really is algorithms that are scoring the resume and applicant tracking systems getting smarter. So what artificial in intelligence is, of course, is using technology to learn and, and using technology to get smarter. Now, something that's actually been around for a while that people haven't talked about much is this idea that artificial intelligence could go through and kind of grade or score your client's social media profiles. So this started in 2014, maybe even 2013, with a system called Crystal Nose. And Crystal Nose would go through people's social media profiles and give them scores on the top five, the big five personality traits. And it was used as a sales tool, is used as a sales tool, that would then tell the salesperson how you should connect with Marie because of, you know, she's an introvert or whatever it might grade in terms of those big five personality traits. Now you're seeing more artificial intelligence being used and, and the talk of more artificial intelligence being used to not only grade the resume that you might upload to an applicant tracking system, but to also go out and grade all of your social media profiles. So you can see here that they're looking at, you know, what are you browsing and what does that say about you? Might we be able to see that you have an interest in something that's not on your resume um, by doing this kind of reading of your your social media profiles. So very interesting in terms of the data. People believe that this might be able to help them eliminate bias because instead of just looking out your resume, they can look more broadly and it's a computer, not a person. So there's less bias. It'll be interesting to see where this goes. Um, Jan Louise, I don't know if you've heard anything about these types of technologies. I haven't seen anything about the profile augmentation, but I'm interested in artificial intelligence and algorithms adapting to be able to better interpret a candidate's responses to questions or, um, or, or work simulations or, or a, a game that they're asked to play online to as part of the screening process that might replace a traditional resume. And companies, I think, are using this more when they are trying to diversify their employee base or pull in people that they hadn't considered before because they didn't have a specific training or a degree. So instead of asking for a resume and application, they ask the, the individual to take a test to do a um, to do a simulation, you know, to here's a work example, what would you do? And then they watch all of the, how the person thinks and what the person comes up with. And they can match that against their best employees in those types of jobs. Those, that's their benchmark. And they can oftentimes, the goal of course, is to find employees who are not from their usual ranks, which is I think a great idea. And I think that artificial intelligence can be a really beneficial tool in those cases because you don't have to have a resume that matches a keyword to get in the door. All you have to do is go online and take a test and assuming you pass and then they would have further, you know, further, um, part of the hiring process. But I mean, I, I, I mean, artificial intelligence obviously is already a big part of many, many things that are in our daily lives. And I think it will continue to grow. It can seem scary because are the robots taking over the world? But if they're acting for good, then I, I welcome them as opposed to counting on human biases uh, in many different areas. I well, that's a great point. And I don't have a bullet here for that, but that is exactly one of the other ways they're using machine learning and um, artificial intelligence is those um, simulations to hire instead of, of resumes or in addition to. Marie, I'd like to add to uh, one of the points you made that I think artificial intelligence poses 
perhaps as a wonderful solution down the road. And that is the bias that is created in LinkedIn. Many years ago, clients and audiences that I addressed raised the question around discrimination on the basis of age because of photographs that would cast somebody in their 60s or 70s, perhaps, even if we paired out years and 20 years of experience. Um, people's worries about gender identity, racial background, other indicators from their photographs. And of course, we've not used photographs on resume for 35 or 40 years, unless in the entertainment broadcast industries. And so if artificial intelligence can smartly help to portray individual backgrounds in a way that delivers some of the kinds of information LinkedIn presently does without the bias and photo element, I think it has great promise. Exactly. Yes. And, it, you know, I think that... Um, it's a challenge because we're in a current market, right? We're in a market where employers really need employees and they're struggling to find them. And I am careful to not get too caught up in what that market is creating because technology will continue to evolve, but it won't always be evolving for these same reasons. In five years, they might be using the same kind of technology to get rid of all the resumes again because they have so many applicants and so few jobs. I hope not, but you know, that's, um, that's one of our challenges when we look at trends and we look at what's going on and we give advice is to not get too caught up in a current market trend that may or may not stick. And one of those trends of course is around degrees and people saying, Oh, now you don't need a degree. Well, that would have also probably been what was being talked about in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. And boy, I don't know about you two, but I've worked with so many clients who didn't get that degree because you didn't need it then. And in 2008, 2009, 2010, they were struggling because now all of a sudden employers could require a degree because they had so many applicants and they needed a way to sift through them. And those people without degrees were struggling. So it's, you know, do you need a degree right now? Maybe not, but we've got to watch that trend. Maybe one of these technologies will replace that in the future. And, and instead of a degree, you'll need to pass the simulation. But I'm always hesitant to give people advice or to get too caught up in those trends when I know that history will probably repeat itself. And in the future, those clients without degrees may struggle because of the trend sh shifting. That's Absolutely right. agree. And with mergers and acquisitions and consolidations, so many mid-tier folks and even higher have to re-interview to retain their positions. Now they are not as competitive without the degree, um, especially when they're going against, we'll say, younger candidates that present with an MBA on top of a bachelor's degree. And it makes it very challenging for them. So I would never tell folks not to pursue continuing education education. Um, I think it's valuable in almost every regard. But there are 18-year-olds that should not necessarily go to college. Um, so there are different tracks here, certainly. Right. And, and the continuous learning and continuous uh, paying attention to what's going on is maybe the critical part. Exactly. And then just someone else is asking, industries or roles where AI simulations and games are being used in the recruiting process, obviously in, in technology, Facebook is talking about that and, and doing that. Um, interestingly, the data shows, so the talent organization that Ger Jerry Crispin um, is a part of, their data showed that the number of companies using simulations in the hiring process had actually gone down from 2016 to 2017, which is interesting. Um, but it's not a huge number of companies that are using those those simulations or games in the recruiting process right now. I think that might change if they find that it actually is effective and is not expensive. I don't know whether either of those things has been proven to be true, but it's like anything else. It's it's you know it's new, it's cutting edge, so it's going to take a while before it becomes the norm. Right. Well, and I think that there was some questions about whether it was um, effective, and that may have stopped it and again the talent just the talent availability right. probably has had it go down a little bit because people are trying to make their hiring process less onerous um, okay. right now because they need talent 
So then there's this conversation going on about blockchain. And we had a speaker come to the Career Thought Leaders Conference in May in Madrid and talk about blockchain and kind of blew us all away because it's something that we are just not um, familiar with. But blockchain, in essence, is a way for an individual to control the sale of their data. So you would be able to tell LinkedIn if you want a recruiter to see your data and instead of them making the money off of that recruiter getting that data, you would get the money off of this data. This is, you know, this is a futuristic thing. It's not here. It's maybe on its way, but but definitely not here yet. Um, Lots of hurdles for this technology to go over in maybe the largest one being that Google, of course, will lose a lot of their business if this goes through. And so there's some movement in the technology industry to to put up roadblocks to this type of technology. Um, But the idea would be that then if you had a personal website, you could get paid by Google when a recruiter searched for someone like you and you showed up in the results instead of Google getting paid for that search result. So very interesting idea, something that we'll definitely keep an eye on, something that would transform our client's ability to control their own data and recruiters' ideas to find people. Um, It would kind of cut out the big corporate, if you will, but how would it work? How would it go? You know, there's still a lot of unknowns there. So we'll keep an eye on that. And I would encourage you to learn more about blockchain. You know, most people know about Bitcoin. That's kind of the, one of the applications of blockchain, but that's not all that, that it could do and, and may do. And it's definitely in the recruiting space, a lot of opportunity for something like blockchain to, to make a play. I have absolutely nothing to add on blockchain because I still don't get it. Likewise. <laughs> Struggling to keep up in that, in that arena. But that, that was a very good uh, uh, summary there, Marie. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I think that um, all of these technologies really, a company is trying to get the best person. And they're trying to figure out how to get the best person without doing as much tedious work. Um, you know, nobody's using these technologies outwardly or, or consciously that I can see or read to do negative things, right? They're really trying to get the best people. And they think that with some of these technologies and looking beyond the resume or looking at the resume in a different way that they can get the best candidates. Um, you'll see that ATS candidate rediscovery. So they're trying to use artificial intelligence to go through candidates who've applied that maybe they missed, right? They're, they're really trying their best to use this technology in a good way, to eliminate bias, to do all of the things that we know HR people have the heart to do. Um, and we have to keep that in mind and help our clients keep that in mind, that there's, there's no evil here <laughs> on purpose anyways. They really are trying to get the best information. And I've got a really good article on blockchain that I'll include in the resources page that I'll send to you. Um, Marie, I have an interesting comment on that or an observation is, yes, they're trying to use technology to help them. In the process, they have made it in many, many cases much more difficult for candidates. So they're trying to streamline the hiring process and trying to get the best people according to what they consider to be the best people. But because of all of the ways that they have to investigate people, the tests that they use, the requirements, the keywords, they're screening out a lot of people. And I I was reading about um, a fascinating uh, company. It's a bakery, a commercial bakery that employs four or 500 people. And they use a, a concept called open hiring. If you go to them and apply for a job, you will be hired for the next open position. In other words, they keep a list. When your name comes up, you're hired. They don't do any testing. There's no resume. There's no screening. There's no background check, drug testing, none of that. You want a job, you come in and you get hired. And then they evaluate where you fit in. They train and they bring you up from an apprentice level to, you know, as far as you can go in the company or in some cases you don't decide not to stay or you um, um, get an education and move on to a different area or go to a different company. They've been doing this for quite some time and they just opened a center called the Open Hiring Center to teach the model. And it is so beneficial for people who are really hard 
to employ, people who have real issues in their background, whether it's a criminal background or maybe a drug background or even a drug use, um, that they would never get hired, but in many cases can and do hold down jobs and do good work. So I think it's a really interesting way to completely remove technology from the hiring process. And just, and you want a job, we'll give you a job. We'll see how you work out. You know, we'll promote you as you learn. We'll give you a chance. And the company seems to be thriving. So uh, it's a really, really interesting concept. And I, I, you know, it warmed my heart to read about how people are being given a chance and making a lot of it and not having to jump through the hurdles that are so frustrating for so many of our clients. That is amazing. It'll be interesting to see how that can catch on and what types of companies are able to use it. So some of the resume things that people are talking about, you know, our infographic resume is going to catch on. Well, the plus of them is obviously the power of visuals. People read things visually much faster. Um, you know, they get content visually much easier into their brain. And you go back to the limitations of applicant tracking systems. Applicant tracking systems read text. They have trouble with graphics. Um, you know, so when we do put graphics in a resume, we always say that you want to capture that critical information in text as well as, as in the graphic. And when, where what's too much? Um, you know, people talk about infographic resumes. They're, they get mixed reviews from hiring managers. Um, you know, I've seen some where they, you know, do this, where they score their skills like, what does this mean? And who scored you in these skills? And, you know, if we are going to use graphics, we want to make sure that we use graphics with meaning, numbers, data, things that apply to our clients' careers that apply to what the recruiter wants to know. Um, so thinking about ways that you can use graphics in a, in a resume that make a difference, that share a story that's important for your client and being careful about graphics just for the sake of graphics. Um, I use Word to do my resumes. You can use Word to do graphics like this, and that way you know that they'll go through an applicant tracking system. They'll be able to be scored. No, this graphic won't be scored, but all of the other data will. Marie, I would add to that that including in a bullet point, either in the profile or in the experience section, a few of the key points relate in a graphic is essential so that it's not overlooked altogether because you're going to make a graphic of the biggest takeaways, correct? You therefore want to ensure it's touched on in a different way in the content of the resume itself. Yes, yep, because that graphic may not be, well, won't be scored by the applicant tracking system, um, but again, it will go through to the hiring reader and have a, a good impact visually, which is what we're looking for, right? We need that not only to be scored, but also to be reviewed by a human reader and, and to get a good information there. Most of the w information on mobile resumes is actually just creating a Word or a PDF resume. It's not really anything different. Um, you know, all of the stuff around modern design that we teach, and again, there's some free resources on our website around modern design, is going to have a good mobile resume in Word or PDF. And companies aren't really going mobile, even though they need to. And resume apps, so actually having a resume that's a, a mobile app that you use some kind of app to apply, in terms of things outside of LinkedIn, there's just not much there right now because companies don't have the receiving end to receive a resume that way and they haven't invested in it and, and most indicators are that they are very slow to put their investments there. So it, it may boom, it may grow, but companies have to have the technology to accept a resume that way before we worry too much about writing a resume that's an app or, or writing a resume that's in some different kind of format than what a company can accept. Um, Maria, I have a comment about that with regard to LinkedIn. The LinkedIn mobile app is, I think, very good. And I think it's a model for what I would call a mobile resume of the future, whether it's on LinkedIn or some other independent um, app developer comes up with something even better and more universal. Because as you can see on the LinkedIn mobile app, and actually the, the, the desktop version is now mimicking that, it's all short stuff and you can click for more. And I think that is a definite trend that is extremely useful because it allows you to, to 
to give people an overview in a very small screen size and then where they want to know more it's instantly accessible to them so i think that's where resumes are probably going um, for mobile purposes and i think we need to think about what is shown in that first few whether it's two lines you know whatever whatever we have available currently on the linkedin app or um, seeing what happens in the future so that we're going to get people excited to want to learn more as opposed to have something that's dry boring and doesn't entice them to open up even just make a click to learn more so i think that as i said the the condensed version with a click for more is probably um, where i see resume is going and gives us some food for thought to how we structure the content. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see when companies get their act in gear and get the technology to be able to do something or if someone from the applicant side will make that happen because that's on the recruiting side, they're just so slow to adapt, especially those types of technologies. They've adapted the interviewing technology, you know, the virtual interviewing much faster, I think, because it offers more ROI for them to invest in an app that accepts a different type of resume. What I'm seeing in terms of their actions, they just don't see the ROI there because there's a process already in place, right? And also they can control that they control the, the once an applicant is in their system and they can make them do what they need them to do. But when they get applicants coming in from anywhere and everywhere with resumes and other materials and a huge variety of formats and structures and quality, they need to be able to sort through that in, a, you know, in one way and not have to customize it for each one that they're receiving. So I think that does make sense that they would put their money into we've already got the people now let's, you know, winnow them down more efficiently because um, they're getting the people. Right. And I don't, I don't see that going in the opposite direction for a while, although there's all the, there's some companies that are struggling to get people, they're using other types of sourcing technologies to find them, not necessarily changing the application process in terms of a, a resume. Right. Right. I agree. So just some, you know, people talked about online resumes and is it, you know, we used to have specific ones like CV, online CV or whatever, and people now can use any kind of free website. I've used Wix and Weebly um, here as examples, but you have Squarespace. I mean, you have so many options to develop a free website for yourself, for your client. I don't necessarily see the formal kind of resume websites making a, a resurgence. In fact, branded.me, or not branded, was it branded.me? One of those went out of business um, because it's just, it's too easy to create these sites with your free websites. And I do think maybe these will make a resurgence, especially as you look at blockchain and, and AI, um, people can control the narrative around themselves by creating their own website and have that be something that's different and more mobile friendly, of course, than their resume. Maybe we should send a note to uh, Wix and Weebly and tell them, hey, give us the, the short version and the expanded version. And maybe they'll add that to their, to their um, structure for the, for the online resume. Yeah. Well, and then Louise, we talked uh, maybe a year ago on, on my radio show about how it really doesn't matter what the resume looks like. We're still going to have to do these things for our client, whether it's a LinkedIn profile or a new resume app or whatever it is, we're still going to have to help our client be consistent in their communications, be focused to communicating what they need for a job target. We're going to have to help them differentiate themselves to tell their stories and to, to connect and target their value to the employer. So it doesn't matter what the medium is, and we'll keep paying attention to that and making sure that people have the tools they need to adjust to the medium. But really, these are our skills, right? This is where our value comes in, is helping our client communicate their story. And that's always going to be a need, no matter what the medium looks like. And in fact, as more different sites get involved in grading our clients, this is going to be more important for them and for us to help them have this consistent story across all of their different pages mm -hmm. that they might have for themselves. I couldn't agree more, Marie. This is where we really 
um, deliver the value, separate ourselves from any platforms or auto writing software that could exist. It is what we do best. It's what our clients are investing in when they work with us, our ability to help them understand the value of their branding and tell their story in a way that serves to separate them from the competition. And it's all embedded in the coaching and writing that we as professionals do. So thank you for sharing that. That. Yes, yeah, I, I well, thank you so much. Hugely. And also because job search has always been, as long as I've been in the business, frightening and uncomfortable and scary and, and unpleasant for people. So they need to be able to turn to those of us who give them confidence and, and provide really high value services for the fees that we charge them. We, we really are making a difference to them. And I think our work is important in that regard because it's not something that people want to do or, or are good at in most cases. So yes, they need us and they will continue to need us even as the, the forum, the medium, the platform, all those things evolve. Um, the, the core of our values not, has not changed. So we have some free resources on the Resume Writing Academy website that can help you do these things. Again, there's a, a 45 minute session on design similar to what we are doing today and a lot of other resources there. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Louise and Jan, for sharing your insight and all of you that shared in the chat as well. You will receive the recording and a link to a place where we'll combine all of the resources and sources for the data that we shared. And we look forward to seeing you on another one of these open calls in the future or on one of our other events. So thank you again and thank you for joining us. Thank you all. Thanks.